have a wonderful speaker, Ulysses Grant Dietz, who first spoke here on February 27, 1992, on the topic, What Makes a Treasure? He's a treasure, look at this thing. And I was 29. <laughs> Ulysses was the chief curator for 37 years at the New York Museum and helped build the museum's outstanding reputation in the, lo lo in the local and national community as well. <laughs> By the way, Ulysses is a great-great-grandson of Ulysses S. Grant, so he's a celebrity as well. So, we're so happy to have you here today, and we appreciate it very much. He spoke yesterday in, o in Ohio, and he came back here to speak here, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, today's topic is going to be fascinating. Sam, you listen to Grant and Mark Twain and the Gilded Age. Oh. My God. Come, yes. That's not the one I thought I was giving. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one you told me. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it may be on here. <laughs> That's fine. I could do that one, too. It's <laughs> fine. We'll hire you again anyway. Wait a minute, let's, let's see, let's or, see what's on this no, flash it's, it's, drive. I think that's what you told me. Oh. Oh, I'm sure I told what, you listen, that. Listen, whatever you say is fascinating. Oh, no, I've so got I'm it. It's on here. I'll be thrilled. <laughs> You're so funny. Before we begin, I want to let, thank all of my fellow friends and librarians for all of their help and support for these programs. I couldn't do it without them. I couldn't do it without friends, because we'd just be sitting here watching me try to fix it and get it together. Um, thank you, friends, and everyone else. And I couldn't do it without all of you, because I don't think you would come from Ohio if there was an empty, empty chairs here. So thank you all. And in a few minutes, we're going to have. Will you be ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Ulysses, I hope that you, let's give a very warm welcome to our very special guest, Ulysses Grant Dietz. Well, we'll wait till it, and then. Now that you all can see that my sweater and my socks match, we can, we can turn off the lights. Okay. Now watch. I'll spill coffee down my lap as I did yesterday. So it's dark. It's after lunch. So if it feels like nap time, that's fine. <laughs> Giving a lecture after lunch is always, I just had lunch, so I'm standing up and I won't fall asleep. But So <clears throat> how many of you have been to the Newark Museum? Not everybody, which sort of surprises me. I have a few ringers in the room because I know they've been to the Newark Museum. Uh, but you know, uh, part of the Newark Museum is the Ballantine House. And I was the decorative arts curator there for 37 of my 38 years. And the last year, I was the director while we were hunting for a new director. And the collection at the Ballantine House was great. And the collection in the museum is enormous. But the real joy of it was uh, all the different connections I could make across things. And there are actually objects that belong to U.S. Grant that are in the museum collection because my family and I gave them. Since I figured I was going to be there my whole career, why not? And, uh, and I've just come off, now I'm, I'm switching gears here because I to had a totally different talk in my head that I had, I had geared just for you all. But this I can gear, gear for you all too. I'd forgotten I was being thrown back into the U.S. Grant thing. Oh yeah, well, you know, I've got a whole raft of talks. But so, but U.S. Grant is very much fresh on my mind because last Saturday was his 197th birthday and I gave a speech at Grant's tomb uh, as I do every year for the last 25 years. And uh, I, I talked about Grant and Reconstruction and we may touch on that here. Oh, I have to figure out how do I... I move this forward just by hitting the arrows, right? Ooh, I can hardly see the arrows. Okay, there they are, all right. And, uh, and so I've been very much thinking about it because last week I was with the U.S. Grant Association for our annual meeting, and we went to West Point where they unveiled a new statue of U.S. Grant on the plane at West Point. The first time in the history of the academy that there's been a statue of Grant there who was 
Uh, and now he's on the plane. The plane is this huge green space where the cadets all march, all 4,000 cadets march. Uh, and he's facing across the plane to Dwight Eisenhower, which seems appropriate. And, uh, and then we ended up at Grant's tomb, where I talked a little bit about reconstruction, and, and that will crop up in here. And I, I now know, I never cared about history as a kid. I never cared about the fact that I was a descendant of U.S. Grant. Uh, I just was, and having to spell the name Ulysses was a trauma. <laughs> and in fact, and given I was born in the mid-50s, and I was named Ulysses for my grandfather, who was U.S. Grant III, and he was a little sketchy about that, because U.S. Grant had a pretty low reputation that a lot of you remember from the years after World War II and into the 60s, and most of that bad reputation was based on fake news, basically, more or less, on, on histories that were written mostly by Southern historians who had an agenda, which was to make U.S. Grant drop as Robert E. Lee rose. And I've made this into my sort of personal passion since I'm the only Ulysses in my generation. In spite of the name, it's never been popular in the family. There are only three living Ulysses in the family now, one of whom is 12 and French, uh, and I just met him. <laughs> And he's adorable. And then a, an older one, Ulysses S. Grant VI, who is like a third cousin once removed, uh, lives in Missouri. And I would never put him in front of a microphone. So, uh, so I've taken that on. But I, I, was, I originally put this talk together under a different title uh, for the Drew University Library when they were doing a fundraiser and they asked me to come in and give a talk a literary talk, and I said, oh, for God's sake, I'm a curator, I need pictures. And they said, well, you can have pictures, and I thought, well, what am I going to do literary? And I have read U.S. Grant's memoirs, which are considered literarily the greatest military memoirs ever written, and earned him a lot of money, but I'll get to that. Uh, didn't earn him any money, he died. Uh, and, then, and then also I've read Mark Twain's The Gilded Age, and Innocence Abroad, and Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I love Mark Twain. I've never read Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer, because those stories don't interest me. I'm interested in the stories about the life of the 19th century. And Sam Grant, as U.S. Grant was called, and I'll explain that, and Sam Clemens were very good friends at the end of Grant's life. And Clemens actually saved the Grant family from poverty. And so that complicated story will go through. Now, the Sam Grant, I can't quite remember what my first slide is. Well, let me try it. Ah, well, that doesn't help, but I'll, that's a good slide. Um, so, and I don't know, again, if the, well, I don't care if it's old news. We hear this all the time. The U.S. Grant Association is in charge of the U.S. Grant Presidential Library. And you probably didn't know there was a presidential library because it's only three years old. And anyone want to guess where it is? And you may know Brian, so you're not allowed to answer. Saratoga. Okay. No, no. That's where he died, up near Saratoga. I was just there. Ohio. Nope, that's where he was born. Oh, this is a good audience. You're like feeding <laughs> me lines. Was just there. Elm Elm City. City. No, that's Sam, that's Sam, that's Mark Twain, that's Sam Clemens. Uh, actually, U.S. Grant's presidential library is at Mississippi State University in Starkville, Mississippi. Which seems crazy, except if you say the word Vicksburg. Vicksburg turned the war, made U.S. Grant a national hero, and for some... Hello? <laughs> Here's a chair right up in front. You can oh, sit. No, I, you know that. Come on now. And, but... And, but the real answer is Mississippi State, when the U.S. Grant Papers, which is 300,000 documents related to his life and presidency, uh, uh, were being published, they needed a new home, and Mississippi State raised their hand and said, we'll do it, and then they raised four and a half million dollars to build the presidential library on top of this, the school library. So there's this beautiful museum that talks about his history uh, and next to it is a whole huge exhibition, a permanent collection about Abraham Lincoln. So in the heart of Mississippi are the two nemesis, nemesises of Mississippi. <laughs> but in fact, Mississippi was the turning point of the whole Civil War. And this isn't going to be about the Civil War, so I wanted to get that out of the way. So, but U.S. Grant was born Hiram Ulysses Grant 
in Point Pleasant, Ohio, a tiny little town on the Ohio River across from the slave-owning state of Kentucky. So U.S. Grant grew up in an abolitionist family across the river from a slave state. And in fact, it was the Ohio River between Kentucky and Ohio where uh, Uncle Tom's cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, thank you, uh, where she set the scene of Eliza crossing the river on the ice floes, happens there on that river in her mind because she was told the story of a slave woman escaping across the river on the ice to get to freedom in Ohio before the Fugitive Slave Act. And that's, of course, I wandered off topic, as I will do repeatedly, you will learn. Um, but he was named Hiram because his mother wanted a biblical name, and he was named Ulysses because his father wanted a classical name. This is 1822, Greek Revival, Americans are all into classical stuff. And so he was named Hiram Ulysses. He realized that he hated the initials, H-U-G. So he shifted it to Ulysses Hiram and was U-H-G. And then when he was named uh, to go to West Point, which he didn't want to do, but his father wanted the free education, and his father was a real piece of work, Jesse Grant, uh, he just said, OK, fine, I'll go. And the congressman who signed the papers to get him into West Point put his name down as Ulysses S. Grant. And that's the way he signed in. And I just at West Point saw the document where he signed in as Ulysses H. Grant. And somebody put an asterisk and said it's supposed to be Ulysses S. Grant. And when he's 17 years old, he's this tall and he weighs 101 pounds. He's a tiny teenager when he moves into West Point, uh, which he declared the most beautiful place on earth. But his friends, immediately, his roommate his freshman year was a man named Fred Dent from St. Louis, Missouri, who would introduce him to his wife. Uh, or the girl who would become his wife, and everybody teased him about being U.S. Grant, Uncle Sam Grant, and then they started calling him Sam. So all through West Point, his classmates called him Sam. One of his best friends at West Point was a man named Simon Bolivar Buckner, who would eventually surrender to him at Fort Donelson. And one of his groomsmen was James Longstreet, who would also surrender to him during the Civil War. So West Point was a place in his era which was very divided between officers who would go on to fight for the <coughs> Confederacy. So that's all sort of background. That's why he's called Sam Grant. But Samuel Clements was known as Sam because that was his name, except we all know him more as Mark Twain. And what Mark Twain did in the, in the third quarter of the 19th century, right at the height of what I call the Gilded Age, uh, is to write a book called the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age was a sly insult to the period. And what it's called, and you, well, two things. You can't, can anybody read this from there? A Tale of Today. A Tale of Today. So Sam Clemens wrote this book called The Gilded Age, where he was trying to show America as a place where people would do anything to get ahead, to get money, and to, and to reinvent themselves. It really was, we were a nation of people reinventing themselves. No money became new money, old money became no money. <laughs> and everything, we were a country that was seething with change. We were expanding, we were industrializing, and the Civil War was this enormous cataclysm, which more people died in the Civil War than had ever died in a war in human history, in terms of sheer numbers and it was a civil war between two sides of one country. And coming out of that, there was huge poverty in the South, which had been based on slave economy, and vast new money in the North, which was all of this brand new industrial money built because of the Civil War. And all that new money had to go somewhere, and that sort of became the hook on which the tag of the Gilded Age was hung by people like Sam Clements because it was gilded. It was gold and shiny on the surface, but ugly and corrupt on the inside. And notice the symbol. Anybody can see what the logo is? It's a diamond ring. And you know what has just happened in 1873? They've discovered diamonds in South Africa. And America has become the largest consumer of diamonds in the world, in the history of the world because we have all this new money in the North, 
buying these new diamonds coming up out of the mines in South Africa. That's a different lecture I can give about jewelry. You can see it all ties together. I also want to point out that we all think of Mark Twain as this crazy old guy with a big mane of white hair. He was a redhead, and he was a stand-up comic. He became a celebrity. He ran away from the Civil War, moved to California. He lived in the, in the gold mines. He lived rough. He lived in the city. He was part of a group called the Bohemians, who were Western writers who wrote about America away from the snobby voice of the East. And he became this incredible celebrity. He was the first great sort of stage celebrity that was not an actor, but it was a presenter, a talker. And he was a redhead. So his red hair and his loud uh, opinions made him the darling of the society world in the East. And if you read this book called The Gilded Age, he doesn't think much about the administration of U.S. Grant. And he's mentioned several times, Grant has mentioned several times, uh, but Twain doesn't quite understand that Grant doesn't actually understand what's going on. Grant came into the presidency as a general, assuming as president that if he said something, it would get done, and that all the people who worked for him, all the people who worked for Congress, were honest and good because they had America's interests at heart. So. Uh, unfortunately, being naive is not a good thing, but we'll get into that a little bit more. So, according to Mark Twain, President Grant, and here he is as a young president, he was at that point in 1869 when he starts in the White House, the youngest president ever elected. He will be replaced by Teddy Roosevelt and then by JFK. Uh, he was 40, uh, okay, <laughs> 46 years old when he enters the White House. He's five foot eight, still very trim, very slender, and has dark reddish brown hair and bright blue eyes. He's a good looking man and he has no idea what he stepped into. He has given up his generalcy. He, you can't be a military officer and rule this country. So you, he, had to, he had to resign from the army. And he went into a position that had no pension for presidents, not until the 20th century. And we'll get, to, we'll get to these later. So there he is in 1869, innocent and hopeful, assuming that all rich men are good men because only God only smiles on good people. And all rich people are smiled on by God, therefore they're good. He was raised a devout Methodist, in spite of his loudmouth father. Uh, his mother was very de devout, uh, Hannah Simpson Grant, and she never came to the White House because she thought it would be prideful. And the day he's elected president, the reporters show up at her house in Ohio and, ex and say to him that your son's just been elected and she is sweeping the front hall and she looks up and says, well, I guess he'll be busy now. And, and her, her husband, however, goes to the White House constantly to mooch, as does his father-in-law, who was a slave-owning planter from Missouri, who made fun of him through his whole life and actually died at the White House, not at the table, however. So both of these Sams and Ulysses' wife, Julia, after whom my mother was named, lived through the Gilded Age from the beginning to the end. They sort of exemplified what happened in the Gilded Age. And here's a description from Mark Twain's book. Squire Hawkins' dwelling constituted one fifteenth of Obed's town. This is a fictitious town on the frontier in Kentucky. The other fourteen houses were scattered about among the tall pine trees and among the cornfields in such a way that a man might stand in the midst of the city and not know but that he was in the country if he only depended on his eyes for information. So it's this idea of these people living in these desperately small little log cabin towns in the west who called themselves cities and imagined themselves to be important. Squire Hawkins becomes a very important character and it's his children who drive the narrative. Oh, it's a, there's a murder and there's all sorts of terrible goings on among families and it's a fascinating tale, but I can't explain it all. So Ulysses and Julia were born on the frontier. This uh, Ulysses born on the Ohio frontier in this little tiny two-room house, there's his father, Jesse Root Grant, 
who is descended from a Mayflower passenger, although nobody knew that until the 20th century. And here is Whitehaven in St. Louis, west of St. Louis in a town called Gravoy Creek, uh, part of the Louisiana Purchase. The Dents moved from, moved from Maryland to, uh, to St. Louis in 1810, seven years after the Louisiana Purchase. It's still howling wilderness. And he buys this house, which he paints, which U.S. Grant paints green later on. That's what color it is now. And he calls it Whitehaven after some supposed fantasy of a family estate. And Fred Dent was a slave owner. He had about a thousand acres and a dozen slaves. And when, uh, see, I can't remember what comes next, but when he disliked Ulysses from the beginning, this little red-headed man with, a, with no beard who hops off his horse and woos his beloved uh, oldest daughter, and he doesn't like his abolitionism, he doesn't like his Yankeeism because he's from the East in Ohio. <laughs> uh, he doesn't think a soldier is ever going to make a good living. So he disapproves of this marriage and actually puts it off. For four years, U.S. Grant goes and fights in Mexico, becomes a war hero in Mexico, also becomes a great coordinator because he's the quartermaster for the American army, and he learns a great deal. And finally, Fred relents that U.S. Grant has acquitted himself, Captain Grant, as he is then, has acquitted himself well, and so he allows him to marry his daughter. And as a wedding gift, he gives his daughter four slaves, four slaves with whom she had grown up. They were children on their, and calling this a plantation is a little grand. It's five rooms. And uh, I've been there. It's a cute house, but it, it ain't no plantation. It's not Tara, <laughs> although Julia imagined it was. And, and even in a small house, when you're surrounded by all that unpaid help who take care of every whim, it's pretty comfy. Jesse was a hard-bitten, money-grubbing man. He actually had more money than the dents, but he didn't own any land. But he was a leather tanner. And so he and, and his leather tanning business made the family money, but also taught Ulysses to hate the sight of blood. He never in his life could eat meat that was not well done. Uh, and if you can't even imagine how appalled by the butchery of war he was. But that's not my point. So here they are growing up, young people, very much of their place and time. This is the earliest uniformed image of U.S. Grant as a, as a lieutenant out of West Point before the beard. Uh, he's attained his full height and his adult weight. And there's Julia as a young woman, probably after they've married. She tends to, she had, a, a, had an eye thing called strabismus, which you might have heard of it. They didn't really quite understand it at the time, but one eye turns in, so she's cross-eyed. I mean, it moves, but it, but it will turn in. So she hated to look right at the camera, so she's usually shown in profile. But by all accounts, she was charming and educated and amusing, and they basically fell in love instantly, and he fell in love first and harder. He was really desperate for her, and it was one of the great love matches of the 19th century. He struggles. He has a terrible time in... Uh, in the army after the war, I mean after the war, after uh, Mexico, uh, and eventually is cashiered out of the army, which is a complicated story. He was, he was sent off west by himself because he couldn't afford to take his wife and their two children. They had two baby boys at that point, one of whom was my great-grandfather. And he goes off to Fort Humboldt, California, where he's miserable and lonely. Uh, and so he finally resigns from the army, comes back east, and goes back and basically begs a job from his father-in-law on the plantation in St. Louis. And there, at his father-in-law's suggestion, and I'm sure Fred was doing this to poison their marriage, uh, he builds himself a log cabin, which is actually now owned by the Anheuser-Busch family. It's called Grant Farm. But it was somewhere else, and it was called Hard Scrabble, and Julia talks about it as the little house looked so unattractive that we facetiously decided to call it Hard Scrabble. Julia hated this house. Julia was a spoiled girl who had grown up in a nice house surrounded by nice things in this dirt floored log cabin did not appeal to her at all. And then I'm gonna pair a, a, a quote from uh, Mark Twain's The Gilded Age about the Squire's house, Squire Hawkins. 
It was a double log cabin in a state of decay. Two or three gaunt hounds lay asleep about the threshold and lifted their heads sadly whenever Mrs. Hawkins or the children stepped in and out over their bodies. So this image of this sort of frontier primitive life uh, was not what Julia wanted at all, but it was the way Ulysses lived with her for only a short while. They eventually gave up and moved in with uh, Colonel Dent and his wife at, the, at Whitehaven. So Grant finally gives up, and, and I won't go through all the sort of stories of, of poverty and stuff, because they really struggle. He pawns his watch one Christmas in order to buy presents for the children. Uh, but eventually he gives up and he says to his father, oh please, just give me a job. And his father actually has branched out. The leather goods business, the leather tanning business has prospered. So he has rented a store, which is this one, in this building in Galena, Illinois, which was a former lead mining town, uh, near on the Galena River, but was a branch off the Mississippi River, right near Dubuque, Iowa, for all of you who know Dubuque. And he and Julia rent a lovely, middle-class brick house up on the hill. It's a very hilly town up on High Street at the top of the hill. And they have, for two years, a completely comfortable, settled, regular life. By this time, Ulysses has four children with Julia. The eldest, Fred, born in 1850. The youngest is Jesse, born in 1858. With their second son, Ulysses Jr., known as Buck, because of the Ohio Buckeye. And their only daughter, Nellie Ellen, uh, who is in the middle. So these children born between 1850 and 1858, and U.S. and his wife are the classic 1980s permissive parents. They never discipline their children, they never yell at their children, they adore their children who adore their father in turn, and they basically let them do what they want, which may or may not have been a good thing, but U.S. Grant adored his children. He always signed his letters, hugs and kisses to the children. So they lived this happy, quiet life for a couple of years until the war breaks out. And then U.S. Grant decides that he wants to get back into war. He never enjoyed the army. He never liked war. But he knew he actually had a gift at it, and he was so tired of working for his father and, and not getting anywhere that he joins. I sort of jumped ahead a little bit here. But he joins, and there's a whole complicated story. He moves very quickly. Within six months, he's gone from being a captain to being a general. And Lincoln has never heard of him. But he's out in the West. He's fighting battles in the West. He's winning in the West. And eventually, he gains the Mississippi. He wins the Mississippi. That's Vicksburg. So the federal troops control the Mississippi all the way. They control the West. And they control the Northwest. So the South is now trapped in the Southeast. And that makes him famous, and he gets made general, the, the head of the armies, a three-star general, the first general since Washington to be made a three-star general. And this is what he, here he is wearing his three stars, still looking pretty young. You can see his blue eyes. And he and his wife move east to, be, uh, to follow the troops around. And Julia is famous in her period for being one of those wives who, with four children, travels back and forth across the country constantly to be with him whenever she can. She is one of the general's wives who is always there as long as it's possible. They actually, for safety's sake, they, they rent a house in Burlington, New Jersey, which is, this is what it looks like, it's still there, still lived in by somebody, and they put the two boys into an Episcopal school down in South Jersey in order to keep them safe and they, she keeps the two smaller children with her. And then she travels from there to wherever she needs to go. So his star rises, and it begins to rise fast. And it rises fast enough, I'm going to, oddly enough, skip over the entire Civil War, because I don't think anyone really wants to hear about uh, Chattanooga or Chickamauga or Vicksburg or any of those battles. Uh, and he wins. He beats the southern armies. He is surrendered to by Lee, who is trapped without any resources uh, in Virginia and at Appomattox. The war ends officially, although it doesn't actually end until the 1960s, really. But that's a different conversation. And when they get back to Galena 
after the war, they have to go home to their hometown in 1865, and they find they are taken in a carriage and driven up the hills in Galena across the river to this beautiful, fully furnished, 10-room, brand new house, which is given to them by the people of Galena. And it will start a tradition of them being given houses. They never, well, they do buy a house. They buy a house in Washington. Uh, but someone gives them the money to buy the house. They never have to pay for anything themselves. So it's a sort of a startling history. And this house only stayed in the family until 1905 when it was turned in. It was given to the state of Illinois as a museum, and that's uh, what it still is. Uh, and it's actually kind of a wonderful house because it's intact. It has all of the earmarks of the genteel suburban villa uh, that you would have found anywhere in America in the, the mid-1860s. It is not a Gilded Age house. It is a middle-class house that looks backward onto the time before America was that rich. So it's hard to imagine that that, that looks like a pretty big house, but in its day it was considered just sort of the ideal home. So you have the parlor with all the modern furniture. This is all the original furniture. It's remarkable. There's a library, there's a dining room, five bedrooms, and a bathroom, and a modern, a modern kitchen. You know, that means a wood-burning stove. And they're quite happy there. But, but he can't stay there because he gets called to Washington and because he's made head of the armies. And he has new uniforms made and heads off and takes a desk job running what later, oh, here's the dining room. And here he is with his youngest child, Jesse, about to smoke a cigar on the front porch of that house. Jesse's about five then. And so they move to Washington, and Julia thinks she kicks the dust off her shoes from Galena, which was perfectly fine when your husband wasn't famous. And they go to Georgetown. And she talks about this in her memoirs, which I recommend reading too. I'm reading them for the third time now. Besides, it was a home in Washington we wanted. Someone shows them a plantation, recently denuded of its land and its slaves, and she thinks that's probably not a good idea, visually. But they buy a townhouse in Georgetown. And we went with Mr. Corbin, who was Ulysses' brother-in-law and who would lead him into the first great scandal of his uh, career as president. And it proved to be most desirable. A large four-story double house with large grounds around it for $30,000 in 1865. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's, well, that's Washington price today. And 10 years to pay it in, a 10-year mortgage, which somebody else paid, by the way. And an upholsterer came down from Philadelphia and placed all the furniture and hung the curtains so that by the middle of January 1866, we were snugly located. And then she goes on and gets all, you know, oh, it's all about love and family. And, you know, really, forget the money that we don't have. We're just going to live the way. Julia had a great way. She was very Scarlett O'Hara in fantasizing that her dreams could come true simply by willing them to be. Fortunately, there were usually people there to help. And my great-great-grandfather, sadly enough, had no money sense, and I seem to have inherited that from him, if not his blue eyes. And she goes shopping. And some of these things... You know, I don't own any of these things anymore. I, did, I used to own all of these things. But uh, she goes shopping. She goes to Tiffany's in New York and buys this silver tray, which is in the Newark Museum collection. And she goes uh, to a store in Philadelphia and buys a whole silverware, a flatware set, in the medallion pattern showing a Roman warrior developed during the Civil War for the northern market. And she figured, what better for my husband than a, sil a silver spoon with a warrior on it? And then she commissions from China through an admiral they know, a huge service of Chinese porcelain with U.S. Grant's monogram and a laurel wreath for Victor. And people say, oh, U.S. Grant picked this out. And I said, do you think U.S. Grant cared about his China pattern? No. Uh, there's some of this, these, these dinner plates are in the Newark Museum, uh, but the other stuff all got sold at auction. So I got pictures out of the catalog. But so as soon as she, her husband becomes famous and they get this house, she goes shopping. She's never had money to spend. And suddenly she has money to spend because people give them money and his salary in 1865 as commander of the armies is $25,000 a year. Huge salary, huge salary. So they have more money than they've ever had and she goes shopping. That's what I would do. That's what I inherited from Julia. <laughs> and in 1869, they settle into Washington. 
Uh, you can see the White House as it looked right after the Civil War. Uh, it looks, you recognize it, but the landscape around it is different. Uh, she has an enormous portrait painted. This is a print based on the portrait by a man named Cogswell showing the family. So here she is. You see, what's important in this picture? Who's the most important person? And this is the 1860s, the homemaker, the housewife, the mother. She is the key to American society. This painting, which I'm told still exists, this is a popular print that was reproduced. The painting is life-size. These are life-size figures, and she hangs it in the Red Room. You'll see that later. And she's there, her children, her husband, their family. And it also points out the fact that she's actually just as tall as he is, and nobody wants to know that. So they have their three years living in Washington, and then the election comes up. Andrew Johnson fights with Grant. Reconstruction is going badly because Johnson wants the South crushed. Grant's, Grant wants the South reconciled. But he's put troops all over the South in order to keep the peace because the elections of the late 1860s are the bloodiest. Every single election, five, 6,000 people are murdered in the South most of them black or Republican whites who are supporting the blacks. So it's an incredibly violent time. It's like the Middle East. It's just extraordinary. And Grant has the troops in there, and he has McClellan and Sheridan down there fighting for this. And um, none of this was taught to us when we were children, by the way, uh, especially not if you were in the South. Uh, but meanwhile, it real he, Grant realizes that when Andrew Johnson crashes and burns, that the Republicans want him as president. And he thinks, oh, well, I've been a general, so I can be a president. It was a bad idea, but not a bad idea. I'm glad he did it, because he, he went into the White House with all the greatest expectations. And of course, Julia went into the White House and said, oh, this is just like where I grew up. <laughs> I can work with this. And she adds this greenhouse onto it. Uh, she's really into gardens. Uh, especially when someone else is paying for it. And this is the White House in the era when the Grants lived there. This big fountain is put on the South Lawn, uh, and that's the White House as it looks in the early, in the late 1860s. Oh, sorry, I meant to say, I loved the dear old house, and if I could have my way, would never have it changed, except she changed it constantly from the day she got in the door. Uh, so much like home to me is the old farm in Missouri, Whitehaven. So there she is thinking, okay, I'm going to take five rooms which would fit in that room and, and make this into my home. She was the first first lady who loved the White House. Every other first lady didn't like it up until her. And she not only loved the White House, she closed the grounds. No more people walking up to the front door and knocking without an appointment. <laughs> this was her children's yard. She started a little league team for her son, Jesse, the baby, the spoiled brat child. And she, and she welcomed people into the White House. She loved parties. She was very social. But this was her home, and she made everybody understand that this was hers, not theirs. And apparently she did it in a nice way. <laughs> and here you see what she did in the green room and the red room using uh, Andrew Johnson's uh, daughter's decoration, Martha Patterson. Uh, so the red room is all the same. See, none of you care about this, but I love this. <laughs> Millard Fillmore's wife, Sarah, brought the piano in. Pol Sarah Polk brought in this furniture in 1847. Mrs. Tyler brought in this marble table, which was only broken in the 1920s. The Polks brought in this. Martha Patterson put this up. But Julia brought her own stamp of approval and put this mammoth portrait of her in the Red Room. Because the Red Room was not some formal room. The Red Room was the parlor for the president and his family. It's the room they used every single day. It was their good room. And the Green Room was the reception room. It was only used for the East Room parties. And there she puts, not even hanging it on the wall, same artist, a life-size portrait of Grant on Cincinnati, on his horse. So he gets stuck in the green room where nobody really goes into the green room except for parties. And this is also uh, Harriet Lane, James Buchanan's daughter, uh, uh, niece, orders all this furniture from a Philadelphia firm. None of this exists anymore. It only exists in photographs. Oh, I wrote a book on the White House. That's why I know all this and why I'm obsessed about all of this. But I love, I love these massive portraits 
I mean, what do you do? You, you grow up in a five-room house and you have massive portraits painted. That's an American transformation. You go from living on the frontier to commissioning an artist to paint a life-size portrait of your husband on a horse. I wish we did things like that today. Today we just have TV shows and stuff. And Julia, the first term, she didn't get much money from Congress. And what I learned about writing this book on the White House is that it's never about politics. It's always about Congress being difficult to whoever is in the White House. It doesn't matter. And they never want to give you money, which is why now there's a whole thing called the White House Historical Association that raises money to do the White House. But Julia got the Blue Room that had not changed basically since the 1850s. She put in, now, this is a room where 50,000 people a year come. Why would you put in white carpeting? I don't know. White carpeting with blue panels. She uses the Buchanan furniture, has it all recovered in blue silk. She brings in a huge gasolier, which survives still in Washington, but not in the White House. So she upgrades the room using what's left from the earlier periods and makes it into her own beautiful space. The Blue Room was the biggest oval room in North America, 30 by 40 feet, huge room. People forget how big it is, and she loved it, but it was really used for big receptions. She didn't sit, sit around there much. And then she goes to work on the dining room, the state dining room. Sarah Polk had brought these chairs in in the 1840s. The Monroes brought in all the gilt ormolu. Julia went in, <laughs> tripping over the cord. Uh, there these huge gasoliers come in. Uh, she adds a billiard room onto the house, so her husband has a place to smoke, because he's not allowed to smoke in the house. And, and that, there's no trace of that billiard room, no drawings, nobody knows anything but descriptions. And she improves the dining room, she redecorates it, she makes the centerpiece bigger because 12 feet long apparently isn't big enough. And this is a, this is a picture of a Grant era state dinner in the state dining room. The only thing in it that dates from the early days is the original 1814 marble mantle, which is now in the red room. And Julia very quickly gets used to living in the east and gets used to hobnobbing with millionaires. And one of the most important millionaires, one of the first really big time millionaires, uh, was A.T. Stewart who invented the department store. Stewart's Marble Palace was a huge, huge block square department store on Lower Fifth Avenue. And he made so much money that he and his wife built this house right after the war, 1868. See how big the people are? This is, this is a couple in their 60s with no children, and they build a 40,000 square foot marble house. And this was the first of its kind in America. It was the first, like, showing off house. I have lots of money. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to build a big house. And here's the entrance hall, and here's Mrs. Stewart's di uh, bedroom. New York City. Oh, New York City. This is where, uh, this is where the Graduate Center, which used to be Bonwit Teller's, no, 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 no. All B Altman's. That that was torn down in 1890, and then B Altman's was built later on that site. But it was a massive house. Newark Museum actually owns a statue that came from that house. And oh, no, let me go back for a minute. I just killed a punchline, but that's all right. But A. T. Stewart, he's an Irish immigrant. He and his wife make piles of money. He's one of those rich men who's a good man. He's honest. I mean, he's probably a ruthless businessman, but aren't they all? Um, and U.S. Grant tries to get him for Secretary of the Treasury because he'd be honest, he'd be smart, but it was actually illegal to hire somebody in trade. This gives you the way this country was founded by landowners because uh, A.T. Stewart didn't own land. I mean, he owned the land this house was on, but he was not a landowner, but he was a tradesman, and therefore they were not allowed to be on the cabinet. And so Grant has to let him go. And that's embarrassing, but it happens. But he stays friends with A.T. Stewart, and Julia uses him as a model. So meanwhile, Julia's decorating. She's having fun. She's having fun with her children and parties and the sort of uh, the unlimited power that being the president's wife gives her socially. She's working on her Methodist crowd. She's working for women's suffrage. Uh, she's really into all of this. But meanwhile, her husband, who thinks all rich men are good, because that's what his mother taught him in, in her Calvinist way, gets embroiled with two men named Jim Fisk and Jay Gould. And here are both depictions of these two guys. 
and there's Grant running around. And actually, Grant does exactly the right thing. Abel Corbin, who is Grant's brother-in-law, married to his sister Virginia, they live in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and he gets lured into this scheme with Gould and Fisk. Jay Gould owns a big country house on the Hudson River near the Tappan Zee Bridge called Lyndhurst, which you can go visit. He was a devoutly religious man, he was not involved in society, and he was a ruthless, all but criminal businessman. You can see the little horns that are coming up in his hair, <laughs> and his pointed ears. And he and Jim Fisk decide that they're going to corner the gold market. And they begin working on that, and they start buying gold and buying gold, and Abel Corbin is involved with it. And eventually, it begins to get dangerous, and somebody points it out to U.S. Grant, who brings a halt to it. And actually, what he does is he, cre he creates a crash, an, an economic crash, but he has to stop these guys from their plans. So he gets blamed for this, even though he has nothing to do with it, and he actually does the right thing, but he causes hardship because of all the people who got caught up in this. So that's his first scandal. And his first realization, or it should have been, that you can't trust every rich man you meet. And he never seems to learn that lesson. He continues to develop his own finances, Here's a check. I love this. I gave this to the Grant Library, and I had this for years. My mother gave it to me. You can see I put it on my dining room table to photograph it. Uh, uh, drawn while he was president in Washington, $20,000 that he invests. And you, Joseph Seligman may not mean anything to you, but Joseph Seligman was one of the great German-Jewish bankers in New York and was one of the good rich men. His son had been befriended by Grant during the Civil War. He was wounded in the war, and Grant went to comfort him in person. So Seligman handled all of Grant's investments, and for a while they did very well when Grant was paying attention to Joseph Seligman. So he, uh, he I mean, that's, again, it's like basically he turned over most of his salary for one year to Seligman to invest for him. So he's playing the game. He's being part of the Gilded Age. He's saying, oh, I've got money. I'm going to put it on Wall Street because we know that nothing bad ever happens on Wall Street. There had been a huge panic in 1873 that broke, I mean, worse than 2008, as bad as 1929, in fact. Meanwhile, Julia is decorating because she gets more money the second time around from Congress. So she redoes... Uh, she, you know, she doesn't redo the Red Room, but she buys all this new furniture from a New York company called Herder Brothers uh, and has that installed in the Red Room. So she finally gets rid of Sarah Polk's furniture, just out the door, into the dumpster. And she rips out the 1815 staircase and puts in this staircase because it creates a sitting room. That's called the West Sitting Hall now, and she creates that so that there's more space for her family. Now, that's a big house. Why does she need more space? because the president's office and his secretary's office and the cabinet room are all in the house on the second floor. So there's really only four bedrooms for the family. And, and, not, and so she doesn't want to have a sitting room. The Oval Room is their library upstairs. But she creates this space. And that's what it looks like until Teddy Roosevelt tears it out in 1902. And she really goes to town with a purpose for the East Room. She takes the East Room, which Mary Lincoln's East Room, Harriet Lane's East Room, Martha Patterson's East Room, all of those up to the Civil War. Basically, it looks like a big shabby hotel lobby with mismatched furniture. And Andrew Jackson's crystal chandeliers. So Julia just scrapes it all out. She adds these massive golden white beams that match the 1814 decoration. She puts in all this. This is 40 by 80 by 22 feet. It's a mammoth room, the biggest room in America at that point in a house. And she brings in all of this golden white. She brings in the biggest chandeliers, 22 foot. So these are 12, 13 feet high, these chandeliers. And she brings three of them in. And she, what she wants to do is she wants to make her East Room, her East Room, it's hers, just the way Newark Museum stuff was mine when I worked there. <laughs> Uh, she wants it to look like the, the Stewart's drawing room. She wants it to look as grand as possible. She brings in all this. This is all the wrong color. But she brings in all of this furniture that's maroon, silk plush, and yellow satin. And it's all this heavy upholstered furniture all around the room and carpeting. The East Room has a crummy pine floor put in by uh, uh, Adams. 
in, 18, in 1802. So it always has to be covered by carpeting. And then all this, these massive mantelpieces pieces and all. So this is Julia's beloved East Room. It becomes her favorite place. And here, for example, she has her, her proud little husband who she adores who meets uh, the king of Hawaii. And I've totally forgotten. It's not Kamehameha. It's Haleo Kalani's father, whoever that was in the 19th century. So she finally has a room fit for her husband. And you can see there are very few really tall people. That's, I think, Sherman, because he's redheaded. Although he never has a beard, so I'm not sure who that is now that I think of it. So this is an international reception to meet the king of Hawaii. And here they are, older, plumper, richer, or they think they're richer. He really never knows how much money he has. He just, people say, oh, you've got money. So he says, fine, I'll write a check. And here are these fanciful backgrounds. Here they are. He's looking very Napoleonic with a hand in the vest and looking, you know, his, uh, his 22 inch waist has expanded rather a lot, just as mine has. I inherited that from him too. And there's Julia very draped and dressed with her elaborate hairdo, just the way a lady of that period should be. Very much citizens of the Gilded Age. And they have a summer house. They build a house at Long Branch. They buy a, long, a house at Long Branch, New Jersey. And here it is. It survived until the 1950s much altered and then was torn down. It was right on the beach and all the houses on the beach basically fell into the ocean. But here it was and it, it, was, it was a big airy open house right on the water so the children could play in the surf. And needless to say, her father who's getting older and older continues to come and harass them and mooch off the family until he dies in 1871. But they spent all, this basically was the summer White House because it was within easy access by train uh, to uh, Washington. And the agenda behind the renovation of the White House East Room was the marriage of their daughter. She was determined. Both of her older, uh, her son Fred, my great-grandfather, gets married in 1874 in Chicago, and her daughter Nellie gets married in 1874 in the East Room of the White House to a handsome and debonair English aristocrat named Algernon Sartorus who turns out to be a drunk and a cheat and a snake in general, who his family doesn't even like. And already these are wedding pictures and she doesn't look too happy. So that marriage is pretty miserable and they never divorce. Uh, they have three children, two girls who never marry and a boy who marries a French woman and all of their descendants are French. That's why the youngest Ulysses is a 12 year old French boy who happens to be living in Miami with his parents at the moment. But I was charmed to meet him because it's a rare name. But this is this big uh, social marriage in 1874, and U.S. Grant cried at the wedding because he knew this man was wrong and he was losing his baby girl. Fred marries the same time. Fred Dent Grant, who has also gotten a little stout, marries this beauty here, Ida Honore, who's uh, a, a society girl from Chicago, Illinois, whose sister will go on to become one of the most powerful social figures in Chicago in the Gilded Age. I don't think I go into that here particularly, but Bertha and Ida Honore uh, are very close and write to each other constantly through the 19th century. And she marries the president's son thinking, oh, he's the president's son. He'll have money too, right? That's a good career. Well, little did she know. Fortunately, they really liked each other. It was a very happy marriage. They have two children, one of whom is my grandfather. So U.S. <coughs> Grant, right up to the end, up to the Centennial Exhibition in 1876. Here he is starting the great Corliss engine, the symbol of power and modernization and industry with the president of Brazil uh, in 1876 in Philadelphia. And then he's done. Rutherford B. Hayes is elected, even though it's a contested election, and the Republicans get to let him win because he didn't win, he actually only it was a contested election, and the Republicans let him win under the bargain that they would pull all of their troops out of the South, therefore effectively ending civil rights for black people for 100 years. But, oh, who cares? We're going to reunite the North and the South and make money for everybody. So Grant decides he's well out of this. What do you do when you're retired, you have no pension, and you have whatever money you've saved or invested during your career? What do you do? Buy a book. 
No. You go around the world for three years <laughs> and spend all your money traveling. And that's what they do. And they, they, they and one of their sons, they keep switching sons out as they go, start on a trip that's going to take them around the world. And then they extend it. So they're gone for two and a half years. On the way, Grant realizes that this is a state tour. And, and it ends up a lot of their expenses are taken up because the U.S. puts them on ships all the way around the world, and they meet with every sitting head of state of every major country in the world. The only time a president has ever done that. The only time it has ever happened. And it's the first great diplomatic tour by an American leader for the whole world. There's been books written about this recently. So there he is with Bismarck, and he was worried about Bismarck. He thought Bismarck was great, but he said, these Germans worry me, they're a little militaristic. <laughs> okay, just to tell you. <clears throat> and he goes and he meets with the Emperor of Japan, the Emperor of China, and this is a man whose name I've totally forgotten, because it's in my script, which is on the computer, but he is the man who is basically the US grant of China. He puts down the Taiping Rebellion in the 19th century and saves China from splintering into warring factions. So there are great heroes together, and so he's the most important man in China, but Grant still meets the emperor, and this is where um, uh, his wife buys all sorts of souvenirs. Julia shops. Grant meets with people, Julia shops. But they meet with the czar, they meet with uh, the viceroy of India, they meet with the Indian Maharajas, they meet with uh, the father of Chula Longcorn, Anna, and the King of Siam, the King and I, they meet with him uh, in, in Bangkok and in in Siam, as it is then. They really meet with everybody all around the world. It's quite an extraordinary thing. And then they come home. Let's see what's next. Oh, here they are in Japan. The Japanese have a huge celebration. They, he meets Meiji, the emperor. And there's this celebration. There's Ulysses and Julia looking suspiciously Japanese. Uh, with these dancing women wrapped in, in costumes made out of flags called the Dance of the Stars and Stripes. And we don't, I, I have, I don't own this, or the museum doesn't own this, but it's a fantastic image. He was, he was celebrated by everybody. He was the most famous person in the world because of what he had done with this nation that was exploding. And nobody knew that Reconstruction had failed because they didn't care. They come back by way of San Francisco. They go and check out the gold mines in Virginia City because that's what he'd been investing in. He'd been investing in the Comstock load. And here he is. There's Buck and there's Julia thinking, what the hell am I doing dressed in this? Uh, there's a Chinese guy. And these are the fairs. I think this is the fairs who were there. Uh, and, 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 and John Mackey, who, these are the owners of the Comstock load, the biggest silver strike in the history of the world up until this point. And they go down in the mines. You could not have paid me enough to go down in those mines. And then they come home again eventually. They go to Cuba, they, go, they travel and travel and travel and travel. Finally, they come back to Washington. No, they don't, because they sell the house. As soon as they get into the White House, they sell the house and all the furniture and then they come back and they're thinking, oh, uh, here we are, we got nothing. So what do we do? Well, friends raised $100,000 and bought them a house just off of Fifth Avenue on 66th Street and gave them $400,000, no, no, $150,000 endowment to maintain themselves. So again, people stepped in and gave them stuff, which is probably totally not legal anymore, but it seemed logical at the time because he was a hero. So I was to have a beautiful home all my own and how happy I was all that summer looking for a house and selecting paper and furniture, shopping, shopping, shopping. But this is what we do. This is what, I mean, and I'm not being cynical. I mean, I guess I'm the housewife in my family, but I'm shopping and, you know, you nest and you want wallpaper and a new kitchen counter. And so she loves us. This is what we do. This is what we've been trained to do since the 1840s. It was a much larger and more expensive house than we had intended to or had the means to buy, but it was so new and sweet and large that this quite outweighed the more prudential scruples. This is the way she thinks about it. It's like, okay, wow, let's not think about that today. And then she goes on and on, and she's collected all these souvenirs over the years. And one of the things I just discovered in rereading this, she doesn't list the details. She says, oh, we bought lacquer in Thailand, we bought this and this. And all of these souvenirs mostly were given to William Vanderbilt, and, I'll explain, and they ended up in the Smithsonian, but I'll explain that later. But in Moscow, she talks about buying a set of silver 
gilt coffee spoons with scenes engraved on them of various landmarks in the city of Moscow. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I have those spoons. I didn't know they survived, because I've had this set of Russian coffee spoons since I was 20. And they've carried with me everywhere, and I almost never use them, but there they are. She shopped for them. <clears throat> she I don't know who was paying the bills, but... And here's the house in New York City on the left. <clears throat> 3 East 66th Street, 26 feet wide, five stories. It was a huge house, not a particularly distinguished house. It was sort of a spec house, and right next to it was the house of the Havemeyers, who were a great New Jersey family who created Domino Sugar. And that whole house, by the way, was decorated by Louis Tiffany, but that's yet a different lecture. But here's the Grant House in the 1890s, all covered with ivy. And in fact, when Julia finally sells this house, the, uh, the Havemeyers buy it to make sure uh, nobody bad buys it, and now there's a little apartment building that I can't afford to live in either, <laughs> right there. So here they are. They're in the capital of the Gilded Age, the heart of the Gilded Age, Wall Street. All of that money, all the, the Vanderbilts, all of these incredibly rich people spending and generating and building money in the city. And U.S. Grant gets convinced by his son, Ulysses Jr., Buck, to go in this is not that, but to go in on an investment scheme, and that does not end well. But meanwhile, Grant is living the high life. For a few years, he thinks he's a rich man. He's told he's a rich man. He says, you have millions. He goes down to Washington. This is, he is not that much shorter than, than uh, this guy, <laughs> Chester Arthur. No. <clears throat> okay, who follows Grant? Rutherford Hayes, this may be Chester Arthur, but, and the reason I, I, I used to own this drawing, which was from Puck Magazine, because he helps the president, whoever is the president in 1882, Chester Arthur, it is Chester Arthur, because <clears throat> Chester Arthur comes in after Garfield is killed, and he hates the cabinet, so he gets rid of the whole cabinet, and Grant helps him rebuild the cabinet. He's supposed to, Roscoe Conkling, who's a senator from Utica, desperately wants this job. Uh, and he doesn't get the job, but he gets this gold-headed cane, which Roscoe Conkling's great niece gave back to me 30 years ago, and I gave it to the Presidential Library. But he picks Theodore Frelinghuysen from Newark for Secretary of State, Mr. Folger of the Coffee Company for the Treasury. So he basically helps pick Chester Arthur's cabinet, and in return, Arthur gives him <clears throat> a silver coffee set later. But meanwhile, Grant thinks he's rich because this charming man who is introduced to him by his son Buck, Ulysses Jr., uh, Ferdinand Ward, who says, oh, have I got a scheme for you, give me your money and I'll make you 10% a month and you'll be earning money hand over fist. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Not quite on the same scale, but it was the first great Ponzi scheme, before Ponzi was not born even. And eventually this all blows up. In 1884, Grant realizes that there's not enough money to pay the bills. People start cashing in. You know the way these things work. You, what Ferdinand Ward is doing is he's taking all the money investors are giving him, paying off old investors, and then spending the rest on himself. And what he does in 1884, when things get rough, he skips town with what's left of the money, leaving the company empty and millions and millions of dollars in debt, including everybody in U.S. Grant's family has invested money in this company, and they're all totally up the creek. So he goes to William Henry Vanderbilt's house on Fifth Avenue and gets a $150,000 loan. He thinks that will be enough. He has no clue how many millions of dollars are involved in this mess. And in return for that, he gives William Henry Vanderbilt all of his souvenirs from the trip around the world, which are supposedly valuable because they were his. And Vanderbilt does nothing with them and after U.S. Grant dies, in fact, they die within a couple of months of each other, uh, gives them all to the Smithsonian in Julia's name, and whatever is left is there in her name. And someday I'm going to go look, but you try to get someone on the phone at the Smithsonian. And at the same time, U.S. Grant discovers that he's bankrupt, and he has to sell the farm in Missouri. They have to give up the house at the Jersey Shore, they all retreat. Fred and Ida are living in Morristown because of Thomas Nast, and, and Fred commutes into New York on the same train I took every day for 38 years. 
and they have to leave Morristown and move back into New York. So the whole family's living in that house on 66th Street. And then one summer, U.S. Grant discovers that he has inoperable throat cancer from 30 years of smoking 20 cigars a day. And throat cancer, there's no pain relievers. The only thing you can do is to wash the wound in the back of his throat with cocaine mixed in water. And that's what he has to do for the rest of his life. And that's when he realizes, I have no money. I have to do something to save my family from poverty. And, Mark, and he thinks, oh, I'm going to write a memoir. And he makes some sort of crap deal with a publisher. And then Mark Twain comes by to visit him, the old hero who everybody knows is sick now because nobody has any privacy. And he says, oh, that's a lousy deal. You know what? My son-in-law has a publishing company. We'll publish your book. And we'll give you profits, and we'll give you this, and we'll give you an advance. And he gives U.S. Grant a quarter of a million dollars advance, the largest advance in history till that time. And Grant starts to write with throat cancer and no money and what he doesn't understand, a year to live, writes a 900-page memoir that's considered the greatest military memoir in history. And ultimately, his wife gets $400,000 in cash, which she will live on for the rest of her life and leave to her children. And part of my retirement money still comes from that memoir. I can't believe it's very much, but she didn't. I thought Julia would just spend it all. <laughs> she didn't. She left it as a legacy, and my grandfather mentions that in his will. But the last month of his life, in June 18, uh, 1885, they go to the Balmoral Hotel at, at Wilton, New York, on Mount McGregor, and the Drexels give the Grants their cottage at Balmoral for the summer, up in the mountains, up in the cool air, in the quiet, far away from the world, far away from Saratoga, 10 miles from Saratoga, and it's sitting in this house that U.S. Grant with his family all around him, my grandfather's there, will finish the memoirs. And within three days of finishing the memoirs, he dies. Here they are gathered that summer around him. So here's the general, 62, 63, 60, 63 years old. His eldest son, Fred. His younger son, Buck. His daughter, Nellie his youngest son, Jesse, Buck's wife, Fanny, and their daughter, Miriam, his granddaughter, Julia, and who's this? Oh, this is Ida, sorry, this is Fred's wife, Ida, my great-grandmother, and my grandfather at three years old, who has blonde ringlets. And he is all there, and before U.S. Grant dies, he writes a letter to the president, whoever it will be, when my grandson Ulysses becomes old enough, I want him to get into West Point. So my grandfather never had a choice. He went to West Point, class of 1903 with Douglas MacArthur. And he's looking none too pleased about it there. <laughs> so the family gathers, and they gather for what the Victorians think of as a good death. The family is there. They know what's going to happen. They know it's going to happen soon. And they're all there to be witnesses. And this doesn't happen very often. Uh, it happens more in the 19th century, but less today. And there's the last shot ever taken of him. He's done with the writing. He's reading the paper at the moment. And by the end of his life, for the last year, he can only, he can't talk. He writes little notes on pencil, on little scraps of paper. And hundreds of those survive. And they're scattered through the family all over. And they're in museums all over the place. But if you go to Mount McGregor, Every single piece of furniture is still there. That chair, that chair that he's sitting in is still there. And it's the most astonishing thing. It just froze. It's a hotel cottage with five bedrooms, all the original furniture there, just as it was the day he died. And that's his legacy, however, is this two-volume set of memoirs. This is the regular, this is the fancy version with the leather spine. There was a green cloth version and there were a few custom-made versions, and it sold, uh, he made $400,000, but it sold 125,000 copies in the first year, an enormous amount. And every single one of the books has this printed on the flyleaf. It's not a signature, it's a print that he dedicates to the soldiers and sailors of America just before uh, he leaves for the country from which he'll never return. So in the end, 
Sam Clemens published U.S. Grant's memoirs, and both of them made money. And Clemens, who wrote the story of the Gilded Age, changed his mind about the president of the beginning of the Gilded Age and turned him into a hero and helped him recuperate, uh, at least temporarily, uh, from the financial losses of the dangers of the Gilded Age, all the scheming that went on. And ultimately, U.S. Grant's star would continue to collapse more and more and more. And by the time this picture is taken in 1897, this is the dedication of Grant's tomb in April 27, 1897, on his birthday. Uh, this is the family. There's Julia, his widow, my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother, my great-aunt Julia, and my grandfather at 16 before he goes into West Point uh, wearing a derby. He wanted to go to Columbia University, but he had to go to West Point. And somewhere in the background is Verena Davis, Mrs. Jefferson Davis, who became a close friend of Julia's at the end of her life, two widows of notorious men whose stars had begun to sink. And they clung to each other and made much of their friendship, which was talked about in the papers as such an anomaly. But they understood that they were both women slightly on the outside of the world. So that's the end of his tale of the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age goes on for, two, for another generation. Grant's two children will have long, complicated lives, and I won't give you that, uh, because there's more than anyone needs to know, although I know it. And I just met a cousin <laughs> that I'd never met yesterday in Ohio. So uh, with Grant's famous tagline that became his campaign promise, let us have peace. Peace as he wanted it, never got achieved in his lifetime. And the dreams he had for this country, I should see, I should quote Fred, Frederick Douglass here, but I did that at the tomb and I didn't know, I didn't know I was giving this talk. But this is what he wanted. He was a warrior who hated war. He was a soldier who hated the army. And all he really wanted in the world and in his life was peace. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I do. I imagine you would. And but I didn't always, and I, I said this last year at Grant's tomb, is that you know when people I was called Grant. I'm trying to write a memoir, and I'm calling it Growing Up Grant because my parents decided they couldn't call me Ulysses publicly because I would be made fun of. Yeah. Because people, as soon as they learned I was descended from U.S. Grant, they would say he was a drunk, he was a lousy president, and he was stupid. And none of those are actually true. And so I've spent my adult life realizing that helping historians, who, who here has heard of Ron Chernow's book, Grant? Of course. Oh, yeah. Well, I've gotten to be quite a good friend of Ron Chernow's because he's U.S. Grant's best friend, and he's visited the U.S. Grant Association. But that book is not, I don't love everything in it, but I, what I love about it is what it says about who Grant was as a person. And I said to him, I brought him to the Newark Museum to talk for our fall luncheon, and we chatted together on stage, and I said, you're U.S. Grant's best friend, because... He gives another side to it. Well, but it also, because he's so famous because of Hamilton, everybody's reading this book. This is the most read biography of U.S. Grant so far. So I'm looking forward to the uh, rest of that. I'm looking forward to the movie, because, uh, no, Spielberg and... Leo DiCaprio had bought the rights to the book. Oh, wow. So we'll see what happens. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I uh, lived in Washington work at the Courtney Gallery, so uh -huh. I to say. Uh, was Julia Grant the Countess, Countess Gazan? Oh, you know that story. I wasn't oh, going to go there, oh, but okay. no, no, they're. they're no, I knew her. Julia's, Julia and Ulysses. Older son, Fred, marries that girl from Chicago, Ida, uh -huh. Ida Honore, and yeah. they have two children. Yeah. Ulysses, born in 1881, and Julia, my great aunt, born in 1876 in yeah. the White House. Yeah. Yeah, because I knew and I lived I met in the same building. Oh, you lived in the Dresden? Yeah. And I met Julia once at my grandfather's funeral. Now, my mother was named for her aunt, Julia. Yeah. But Ida's sister was Mrs. Potter Palmer of uh -huh. Chicago. And she had two boys, but no girl. 
So she takes Julia under her wing and takes her to Europe in 1898, and there they meet a Russian prince who she marries in Newport in 1899. So my great aunt Julia becomes a princess, and we all know that didn't end well, Russia. And then her husband, her philandering Russian prince husband, I don't know if she ever talked to you about him, but she had divorced him long since by the oh, time oh, you she, knew her. Oh, she didn't. But he became a banker in Florida. So to have a husband who's a little sketchy, who's a prince, is one thing. To have him as a banker in Florida is another thing. <laughs> so they parted amicably, and he's married, buried next to his second wife in Sarasota. Yeah. So the thing about her was that she was amazing to the white Russians. Oh, yeah. Who came to this country. They all adored her. Yeah, well, she was very much the centerpiece of that. She did not like Franklin Roosevelt, which didn't help my grandfather's career much. Uh, but she and my grandfather were very, very close. She, yeah. she was, he was her little brother. and yeah. they. So I met her the first time and only time when I was 13 at his, at his funeral in Washington. So I went to that apartment in the Dresden. Yeah, the Dresden, yeah, that, it was a wonderful building full of fascinating. Yeah. No, she was, she, I'm pretty obsessed with her, and this cousin I just met is her great-granddaughter. Oh. So she has memories of, of great-grandmother Julia. I don't know why we're two different generations, because we're only two years apart, but Julia started having babies a lot faster than my grandfather's wife yeah. did. So uh, there we are. It's a complicated story. You say the Gilded Age goes on after U.S. Grant's death. Yeah. Both of his children have very Gilded Age marriages, but yeah. that's another lecture. <laughs> we can come and talk about my family again if you want. So, yeah. you, know, say, you. you always hear it say that you know, history is written by the winners. That's how, true. how do you think that this happened, that, you know, that Grant somehow got lowered as Robert E. Lee well, got elevated? There's more to be written about this because the first stories of the Civil War I mean, the generals all wrote boring memoirs that nobody read except U.S. Grants. And then Southern generals begin to write their side of the story, and the first major historian who writes a book about the Civil War in the late 19th century is a Southerner who writes it with an extremely anti-Grant point of view. Oh, the North had more people, the North had more money, Grant was a butcher, he sacrificed his men needlessly. There's been so much analysis of the dead during the Civil War. The North and the South actually lost pretty much the same number of people. And it was not about numbers, it was about management. And Grant was a brilliant, he was a lousy politician, but a brilliant manager. And it was the first war with modern warfare machinery, I mean, weapons that would, I mean, we were scared of the atom bomb today, but the Minier ball, which would explode and rip you to shreds, was, I mean, the descriptions of the war are pretty harrowing. Uh, but it's also the first war waged with railroads and telegraphs. So Grant could manage the entire war from Virginia by telegraph. And, and I just think it's, it's a complicated thing, but what it is is in the aftermath of the Civil War, you know, and there's all this ruckus now about statues in the South. Yeah. Yeah. None of that yeah. happens until the 1880s and 90s when the North and the South, meaning the politicians and the businessmen, have gotten together and said, it's all about industry, it's all about making money, it's all about us being one, and you do whatever you do need to do to feel better about it. And that's when the rise of the lost cause, the idea, now, and, see, and I don't want to get into controversy, well, yes, why not? I'll just say that. I am. But basically it's this notion that the South's moral position during the Civil War was just as good as the North's. And that had never been accepted until the 1880s when basically the North allowed it uh, and said, okay, whatever you need to say to make yourselves feel better, and if you need to run down Grant, who cares? He's dead, his wife's dead, nobody cares. It's all gone. And that's what happens, and there are books being written about that now, so that's why I haven't read them because it's so, it aggravates me so much. But basically, it was like, let's find every bad thing he did. All the rumors of his being drunk, which I gotta admit, um, Ron Chernow really goes with. I mean, he, he decides that, yes, Grant had a drinking problem, but this is how he fought it. He was a noble man with a weakness, and he was not a drunk. He was a man who fought an addiction. And that might be true, but it makes Grant as a noble man with a flaw, as opposed to this drunken sot, which was definitely not true. He never drank with Julia anywhere nearby. She didn't drink. She was a Methodist. <laughs> and he, he was not baptized, actually. He was a lifelong Methodist, but was not baptized until he was dying. So he resisted 
as the way a lot of men did in the 19th century. But it, it's, a, it's a real puzzle, and it's something nobody, I didn't know about. Even my grandfather didn't know about. That's why he was sort of strangely upset that I was being named Ulysses, because that I was going to carry this burden that had gotten heavier and heavier uh, with him. And yet, you know, when my grandfather, he was the head of the Centennial Commission for the Civil War, he was in Life magazine, and he was in National Geographic. I mean, U.S. Grant III, this distinguished old white. I didn't show you a picture of him. He was very handsome. Uh, but he totally bought states' rights. He said, you know, he bought separate but equal because it was states' rights. And he bought into it, for God's sake. His father hated states' rights. His father thought states' rights were the only, were an excuse for prejudice to be forced on people who didn't want it and to keep the South in power. But if you want a book, a big book that will really freak you all out, read Jill Lepore's These Truths, which is probably in this library, because that is a history of the entire United States with an angle on it. And uh, that'll raise the hair on the back of your head, too. But it will also explain part of what happened uh, for Grant Star to fall. And so I got into all of this I, uh, in the 80s when I went to Grant's tomb and got caught up in a lawsuit as the plaintiff, because my name is Ulysses. And that's when my boss at the Newark Museum said, start calling yourself Ulysses Grant Dietz, because then the reporters in the New York Times will pay attention to our press releases. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Ulysses Dietz means nothing. Ulysses Grant Dietz actually means something. So it's weird. I'm still embarrassed to be called that, but because it seems pretentious. But but you're right, and there's there's more being written on it every year. Yeah. And by the way, U.S. Grant the, the wisdom is that Frederick Douglass, who adored U.S. Grant, adored him, and I used that at Grant's tomb, but I can't remember my quotes. Uh, and Frederick Douglass lived until 1898, and he watched everything collapse. He watched his people put back into slavery after U.S. Grant was swept away. And uh, there was, I was in the middle of something and then interrupted myself. Um, where was I going? Well, we'll see if I can come back to it. No, but see, Frederick Douglass is what drove it out of my mind. I said something about it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There was a statistic I remember. In 1876, there were 103 registered black men in Louisiana voting. No, I take that back. In, see, that's not going to work. 1910, 1908. 1890, oh, in 1898, 103,000 registered black men in Louisiana. 1910, 500. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It went back. It went back. Black men couldn't vote in the South for most of the 20th century until I was born, until I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but in my lifetime, you all remember this. This is the 60s, and we forget. We all thought that was happening for the first time. It was the second time. U.S. Grant created the Civil Rights Movement in conjunction with people like Frederick Douglass. And he was pushing for it, and it all got swept away. It's just, and that's, he's never been credited for that. And, and Ron Chernow does give him credit for that. So that's. Well, I can be credited for remembering anyway, so much. <laughs> oh my God. You are amazing. Next time I'll talk about jewelry, no controversy at all. Listen, you are amazing. You can talk about anything and make it fascinating. I mean it. I'm retired. I sit quietly in my house most of the day. Well, you must have been reading quite a lot because that you could, that you put it all together so beautifully. What a special program! Thank you so much for coming. And I hope you enjoyed it. Everyone should go upstairs and now get a look out on grants or the Civil War, or the Gilded Age, you, you gave us so much. Thank you.